Welcome to our second half 2021 market outlook titled Hope into Reality. First, a review of our past calls. Now, throughout this period of great uncertainty, a period of start-stop cycles of lockdowns and reopenings, we have been advocating that you stay invested. Back in March 2020, in the eye of the pandemic storm, we said to build portfolios that will last, resilient portfolios that would employ our barbell strategy. Since then, we have made market calls under these headings, resilient in the storm, on demand, a new hope, and back on track. I am pleased to note that our calls have been on the money as we wrote this entire uptrend. Today, I'm presenting hope into reality, a fulfillment of a new hope. When at the start of this year, we said we were beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel with the rollout of vaccines. By no means are we saying the entire world has turned the corner in its fight against the pandemic. We hope and we pray for many countries that the pandemic spread will be kept under control with the swift distribution of vaccines. So, where are the markets heading for the second half? Legendary investor Sir John Templeton had said, bull markets are born out of pessimism. They grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and they die on euphoria. Let me pause here and ask you for your participation in this polling question. Where do you think we are in the market cycle? Are we at pessimism stage, skepticism, optimism, or are we already at euphoria stage? I invite you to use pigeonhole on your device to vote. All right, 52% so far feels that the market is in optimism stage, 32% skepticism, only 10% in euphoria. It's quite an interesting observation. Okay, I think we're about there, 50, 30, in between skepticism and optimism. Thank you all uh, for your uh, participation. Looking at the wall of liquidity, or the tsunami of cash, in excess of $5 trillion, which is uninvested today, clearly, I would agree with you, the markets are not at euphoria phase. My conviction is that we are somewhere between skepticism to optimism phase. And some markets obviously are closer to the optimism stage, in particular the US, while the rest of the world, including Asia, are likely to be nearer to the skepticism stage. Therefore, we think this market is not about to turn over or not at the brink of a bear market as yet. So, the pertinent question is to, is, uh, to ask is, now that the markets have rallied so hard, are all the good news already being priced in? Indeed, we see pockets of bubbles. For example, in EV, electric vehicle space, in cryptocurrencies, in SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies, and in meme stocks, the likes of AMC and GameStop. But our view is that these are but pockets of bubbles. They are not broad-based, not systemic. In fact, if you look at the chart, some of these bubbles have deflated somewhat, and the impact on the broader market has been minimal. So why do I say that we are not in a broad-based bubble? Now, to answer this question, let's take a deeper dive into technology, where most investors are of the view it is becoming an overstretched bubble. 
not dissimilar to the dot-com era of the year 2000. But our analysis indicate valuations today are really not the same as during the dot-com bubble. It is true, price-to-sales ratio have surpassed the previous high, but if one looks at the price-to-earnings ratio, we are nowhere there. This simply tells me that unlike the dot-com era, today, big technology companies are highly profitable. And in fact, the profit margins of these companies are ever-expanding, as demonstrated in the widening gap between sales and earnings. Big tech companies possess the ability to turn sales into real earnings, free cash flows. And many of these companies are generating more and more recurring profits through their subscription-based offerings. Common examples include Amazon Prime, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Shopify, Zoom. Now, recurring revenue business models are resilient, at the same time, extremely scalable. And the market will attach a huge valuation premium to such businesses. Imagine a company like Disney with an expected subscription base of 250 million in a matter of two to three years. I'm sure you can appreciate the resilience of such a revenue model. 250 million individual subscribers, each paying $10 a month to consume their magical content in Marvel, Pixar, Disney, Star Wars, National Geographic. And you can also see the scalability of such a model. A $1 increase in monthly subscription would be $12 a year times 250 million, $3 billion straight to the bottom line. So our investment approach in DBS is really to seek out such companies, companies that generate real earnings and free cash flows, as opposed to companies that are still making losses through heavy subsidies just to bump up sales volumes. The interesting development this year is the rotation among sectors. Energy stocks, oil and gas, which fell some 30% last year, recovered strongly this year, up 50%. The other laggard sector, financials, banks, is up 25% this year versus negative 5% last year. Now, we see this as a broadening of the market. Essentially, we see this as a balanced, sustainable market compared to a market that is only pulled up by a narrow base such as technology stocks. It is worthy to note that in spite of this rotation, the growth sector of technology did not fall. In fact, continued to rally. Last year, it was up some 50%. This year, so far, up 10%. This tells me that the same funds in the stock market are not flowing out of growth into value. Rather, it is new, fresh funds from outside the equity asset class, primarily from cash that is flowing into the stock market. Now, barring any exogenous event, we do not see a market that is about to crash despite having run up 80% from the pandemic lows. Now, the market is well supported by the dynamics of FOMO, fear of missing out, due to this wall of liquidity, uninvested cash at the sidelines. As well as from TINA, T-I-N-E, there is no alternative, or should I say TRINA, there really is no alternative to equities, even where cash deposits and where bond yields are today. There is also a dynamic, another dynamic at work, something that I do not hear a lot being talked about in the public domain. And that dynamic 
is the aspect of what we call limited supply versus unlimited supply. Today, compared to 15 years ago, the number of outstanding shares in the US stock market has in fact contracted by a third. Why? That's because US companies have been highly profitable, highly competitive globally. Legendary investor Warren Buffett had said many times, the US stock market is like an ATM machine, con continuously or constantly spewing out cash with this high generation of profits and cash flows. US companies have been conducting share buybacks. Hence, the shrinkage in the number of outstanding shares. Put against the unlimited quantity of liquidity, printing of money from the Fed's QE programs, it is no surprise to see the buoyancy in the stock market. And this aspect of limited supply versus unlimited supply is not about to change anytime soon. We advocate that you stay invested through our barbell strategy. So what is barbell? It is to take overweight exposures in two areas of focus. One end of your portfolio buy into income generators. On the other end of the portfolio buy into secular growth companies. I may sound like a broken record because I've been advocating this strategy for the past three years. But that strategy has worked and I'm convinced it will continue to outperform going forward. It is clear to us that many sectors, many industries are faced with structural headwinds of technological disruption. Therefore, if you are a company in these sectors and you cannot reinvent the way you do business, you will very soon become obsolete. So we see here today Video streaming, Netflix, Disney Plus, upending movie theater distribution, Airbnb, disrupting travel and hospitality. Of course, FaceTime, WhatsApp, Skype, upending communications, PayPal, Google, Apple Pay, banking services. And of course, Lazada, Amazon, Shopee, disrupting brick and mortar retail. So there is a sea change on how you should be investing these days compared to the past. The traditional way of investing is buy low, average down. That no longer works in this new world. Shares that have crashed and look cheap do not necessarily mean they are attractive. In our fast-changing world, cheap can stay cheap will still become cheaper. So, for growth, zero in on companies that ride the secular or long-term irreversible growth trends. And on the other side of the barbell, load up income generators as we deem interest rates will stay low for a considerable period of time. We also add assets that are lowly correlated to equities and bonds. We call them risk diversifiers. So here are the themes that fit into our income generating assets, secular growth, and risk diversifying assets. On income, we like the double B, triple B rated corporate bonds. We like China banks for their dividend yields of five to 6%. Singapore REITs, four to 5% dividend yields. Hybrid capital, the likes of the AT1s, additional tier one capital of uh, European banks. RT1s of insurance companies. And if you do like a lot of income, uh, another source of income, what you can do is you can overlay your equities with what we call a cover core strategy to harness income from it. And then on the secular growth side, we like companies under this acronym IDEA. I stands for innovators, the likes of Apple. Disruptors, D, the likes of Airbnb, Netflix, 
Amazon, Alibaba. Enablers, E, the likes of semiconductor companies that enable cloud computing. Very soon, Internet of Things, autonomous driving, AI. And adapters, traditional companies that can successfully transform and adapt to the digital world. And finally, we have gold as risk diversifier. Due to its low and negative correlation to equities and bonds, having gold would improve resilience in the barbell portfolio. Gold, like US stocks, also have these characteristics of limited supply versus unlimited supply. Scarcity. The World Gold Council estimates the total stock, the total supply of gold in the world today is but the size of three Olympic-sized swimming pools. Put against the Fed's balance sheet, the amount of dollars printed liquidity, we believe there is potential for price appreciation. So we have put together this video to summarize the factors that would impact the price of gold. Please enjoy. The efficacy of our barbell strategy is shown in the track record. We launched a barbell fund some year and a half ago, and the return on that fund is 32%, outperforming the underlying index comprising 50% global equities, 50% global bonds by about 600 basis points. Let me now turn to the next secular change that will take place in the world we live in. What is it? It is the transformational shift from ICE, internal combustion engines, to EV, electric vehicles. The transportation sector is the largest contributor to greenhouse gases. Back by strong policy support by governments towards decarbonisation, as well as the changing consumer attitudes towards sustainability. It is estimated in the next 10 to 20 years, for every 100 of new cars that are sold, 60 would be EVs, as opposed to just three today. Governments, in many large economies have put in place policies to accelerate this transformation. Among them, the Chinese government has been the most prescriptive. They impose mandates on automakers to sell a fixed number of EVs each year, failing which the automaker will be fined, slapped with financial penalties. So 2020 was really the pivotal year as global EV sales grew 40%, even though overall car sales fell 14% due to the pandemic. Falling production costs, for sure, is the key to this transformation from ICE, internal combustion engines, to electric vehicles. 
after seeing battery costs fall 90% in the last 10 years, we expect EVs to reach cost parity with ICE vehicles by the end of this decade. Now, the trend of electrification is not going to stop at just cars. Elon Musk, one of the greatest innovators of this digital era, has air transportation in mind too. So who are the winners of this transformation shift into EVs? For sure, pure play EV companies, the likes of Tesla, are the biggest winners. But we have also the battery innovators, as well as the charging infrastructure providers. I would add to that list legacy automakers, the likes of Toyota, Volkswagen, GM, Ford. But why? Today, the market value of Tesla is $600 billion, the same as the combined market capitalization of Toyota, Volkswagen, Daimler, GM. Because of this secular shift, the market assigns a substantial valuation premium on Tesla, on EVs. Tesla today trades at 300 times price to earnings versus legacy automakers at 10 times. So you can very quickly see the potential of a huge uplift to these share prices of legacy automakers if they can execute this transformation successfully. Volkswagen has said it will be investing 85 billion. Ford GM have plans to be carbon neutral, each investing 30 billion each. And on the back of these announcements, we have begun to see their share price perking up. Let me now touch on the risks to our market view. The main risk is certainly the fear of inflation, especially on the back of commodity prices surging of late. Now, the Fed is relaxed about it, saying it is transitory in nature. And that's due to the reopening of economies and the short-term impact from supply chain disruption, which caused prices like computers and handphones to go up on the back of shortages in semiconductor chips. Now, given the ultra dovish stance of the Fed, the fear is that the Fed will be caught behind the inflation curve and we may have a situation of a runaway inflation. And runaway inflation is like a genie out of a bottle, extremely hard to bring it back down. So the fear is that we could end up like in the 1970s, 1980s, when inflation ran away and the Fed had to be aggressively raising interest rates. The then chairman of the Fed, Paul Walker, had to raise rates to 20% then. But really, our central view is aligned with the Fed. We think the current elevated inflation figure of 4%, even 5%, is not going to be persistent. Why? Take Japan as the forerunner. Japan has been doing QE, deficit spending, for the last 20 years. Where is inflation today in Japan? Non-existent. Why? Because of the structural headwinds coming from demographics and aging population. And that same factor will be impacting US and the rest of the world. Coupled with deflationary forces brought about by digitalization, automation in factories. However, the Fed is certainly cognizant of this risk. So if we compare the situation today versus the year 2013, when the Fed tapered their policy by reducing QE or purchasing of bonds, then the case for tapering is justified. Just look at the macro factors, growth, manufacturing index, inflation, the conditions are not dissimilar, in fact, stronger than 2013. So we think the Fed will be tapering their policies. What is the impact of this? Now, if the Fed is seen, and we believe so, 
preemptively tightening policy, either through tapering or through rate increases, that is not necessarily negative for stocks. Look at the year 2017. Both interest rates, Fed funds, and as well as bond yields rose. Equities did not fall. Instead, it continued to rise. However, should inflation really become a permanent feature and non-transitory, we would definitely have to reassess our outlook. So this is how we would advocate for a balanced risk portfolio to be positioned in. 50% in equities. And because of our barbell approach, growth and income, we would have exposures into uh, US and Europe as well as in Asia, primarily for equities. We would have 31% in fixed income, a rather sizable uh, exposure into Asia corporate bonds due to its attractive yield levels. 9% in gold as a risk diversifier, and that will add to portfolio resilience. So in summary, hope into reality, Fed will taper, but they will say we will keep rates zero bound for a considerable period of time. That kind of policy stance is supportive of equities, credit, and gold. Buy into IDA, ideal companies, and electric vehicle winners for growth, high yield bonds, double B, triple B rated, and dividend yielding stocks for income. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention.